But when we're looking then at these dynasty formats that so many listeners are going to be doing now, it's so much fun because you have all four positions that really matter. And that's going to really be the foundation that you're jumping off from as you're starting your dynasty league. Right. And I think that's a big, like, that's a very important point is that there's, there's this eternal debate between, you know, do young players get drafted too early in startups? Can you join a dynasty league and just take all of the veteran values and, and take this win now approach where you can get some players well behind their redraft ADP in a startup. And so you can build a super team. You can build a team that has multiple first round picks, multiple second round picks. We talked recently about a team where I took Christian McCaffrey in the fourth round. He's a you know top three start, redraft pick um, to be able to get those types of values if you wanted to just go for it in year one. And it feels a lot like you're still going to have plenty of value into year two, into year three. And I think a lot of new dynasty players are immediately drawn to that because they're coming from redraft. I know when I first started, I was drawn to this idea that if I just don't chase the young players, I can have this super team right away. And you can do that. And you can go after the win in year one, especially if you're in a league where a lot of people are trying to build longer term, you're going to have the edge, certainly. The challenge is, as you said, you're laying the groundwork for a long-term thing. You're joining a dynasty league to be in it for multiple years. And almost without question, when you do that, there's a reason those guys are going where they are in the startup. And you can't then just turn around necessarily in, in almost every dynasty league. Some of them, I think, still overvalue veterans. But you can't just turn around and trade them and rebuild easily because they're just getting a year older you're really running this risk of an age cliff. And it's something we talk about in fantasy a lot, even in redraft, where once guys start to decline, once they hit a certain age, it's not, you know, we, we see those age curves. It's not really usually a slow decline. I mean, often we just see guys completely lose it and their value completely craters. And when you're drafting those types of players, essentially you need them to continue to produce at an incredibly high level just to maintain value usually if they do have that bad season, suddenly they're no longer interesting at all. They're coming off a bad year and don't even look like they can be big producers at an advanced age. And so you, you can't get anything out of them. You wind up with a roster pretty quick. That is really hard to then get back to a high level. It is. And what you're saying there reminds me of a great article that Blair Andrews has written in his wrong read series talking about uh, wide receiver bounce backs for example after a bad year the number one thing that we see is that it's difficult to bounce back and then the number two thing is that it's difficult for older receivers to bounce back and it's difficult for receivers who weren't superstars so someone who is a, a very valid contributor in fantasy but not a star those players when they drop it's hard to get back and it's hard to get back after injury as well and i think that you know, sometimes we see a guy who gets hurt and think, okay, well, it was just the injury. And as soon as he's healthy again, he'll be the same guy. The problem is that you're not always the same guy, but even if you are, as you get older, NFL teams don't want to take the same chance on you. Right. And so as these guys get up there in years, the risk is simply that even if they were still fairly solid, that the NFL teams are not looking at them as someone who can do the same things for their roster that you want to do for your fantasy roster, right? Which is to be an ascending player. And even if you still have that skill level, but you don't have that potential to be an ascending guy, the team is like, it doesn't make sense for us to prioritize you over someone else who's younger on our own team. Even maybe if that player has a little bit of projection and needs to do a little bit of improving. So you have a lot of different types of risk and that element you mentioned where you see these guys, not just decline, but fall off the cliff. I mean, that makes sense, right? Because from an NFL team's perspective, they're not necessarily looking for someone or approaching it from the perspective of, okay, this guy is going to go from, you know, 225 fantasy points to 175 fantasy points. Maybe that's still fine. It's a matter of they go from being a starter to not a starter. And as soon as that flip happens to where you no longer have quite enough of an edge that you're a starting caliber player, then you're not out there on the field. So you don't, drop a little bit you do go almost to zero and that's something 
that redraft players need to be much more aware of. But it's also something that in Dynasty, when you're looking at the potential to trade these players, number one, people in your league are not going to want to take that risk. But then number two, even if another manager might be willing to take the risk, if you wait till after they hit that cliff or they completely collapse, then, I mean, it's not a matter of will somebody take the risk. It's just you have an asset that's worth zero. And so that path to being the champion early is difficult because even if you have the best team, then what are really your chances to win the league, right? We see this a lot of times where, especially in leagues that are very sort of youth oriented, where you will then see someone zig when everybody else is zagging and take the veterans. And then you see them go and they finish second, they finish second. And then they're into this massive rebuild, depending on how your league is structured Finishing second twice may pay for your league entries for a while. And it may be something where you feel okay about that. You were in the championship game. You could have won. I mean, all you can really do is give yourself the chance to win. But once you hit that wall and you have to rebuild, then I think the thing that jumps out is that that rebuild is very different than punting the first season. Because if you do what we've talked about where you trade back in your startup draft and you have all of this firepower for the next year, we were kind of joking that we were trying to not make the playoffs in the first year of our RV TriFlex startup. <laughs> and we unfortunately got that last playoff spot. So we didn't get you know, our particular pick. Some of the other picks were a little bit earlier that we had traded for, but our pick was the 107. You get in this situation where it's just so very different. Our team already was better than we wanted it to be. And year two listeners who have kind of gone through that journey with us, where we did do the draft and we talked about the players that we took, we were optimistic for the team. You could always be wrong. It, we have built a little bit more running back light. Although once the rookie draft was over, we had a decent number of people at that position. You could get hit with injuries. You might have to postpone even for a year, but Overall, our team is going to be competitive now for a long time. You take that win now approach and you play for two seasons and you miss, or even if you win, and that can be great. I mean, you're the champion. And in that case, you are probably going to pay for your entries for a while. But that rebuild is very different. I think that maybe that's the part that sometimes people miss. They think, okay, I'm going to win and I'm going to rebuild. But that rebuild is like a five, six year process. Whereas when you trade back in the startup, you're really looking to be potentially the best team in the second year. And one of the big things with any of the rebuilds, and I know this from experience, one of the very first, I think maybe the very first uh, startup I ever did, I did go a little bit more veteran heavy and my team was really good. It didn't ever win. It made the semifinals, I think the first three or four years of the league, but then eventually the rebuild hits when you're saying they're very different, one of the things is you can't really stockpile additional darts. And so you you have to hit on your young players when they come in. And Sean, we've talked about this team before. I've told you that it's been a little bit unlucky. It's hit basically every sort of landmine that you could imagine. I took Nikhil Harry. I took, unfortunately, LaVisca Chenault looks like you know, a potential landmine as much as I've talked about you know him being worth this 20th round pick recently. Um you can go way back. I took Leonte Carew as a guy that, you know, people who are more more recent to fancy football won't even know that name. Uh, Henry Ruggs was a draft pick for this team. There's been several that uh, you'd hope would pan out, but haven't, right? I mean, almost exclusively haven't. And when you're only getting basically the one first round pick every year, because you can't trade these aging veterans for, for, for additional first round picks, it you have to hit on those picks and you can, I mean, obviously I, I could have hit on all of those early receiver picks and, and suddenly my team could be good again and sort of would have been able to transition a little better. But um, when you talked about the five, six year rebuild, that was the team that immediately came to mind where every time I miss on a Nikhil Harry, a high draft pick wide receiver that I thought was going to be very good. It pushes me back another year, right? It's just like, got nothing else i needed to kill harry to be really good and then potentially to flip him and, and to keep building 
one of the things and it really hits you in two ways, right? Because not only do you not have the players that you need to be competitive, but when you miss them, you don't have the trade assets that you would need. Because one of the things you need to do in a rebuild is to not get caught up in this idea of foundation players. You take someone like a Harry and he hits, and then you trade him for multiple pieces. Because like you said, the veterans won't get you multiple pieces. But if you have a Harry and he doesn't hit, you can't get multiple pieces out of it. And so it pushes the rebuild back in several different ways. Right. But when you're basically starting from this productive struggle or the initial rebuild, if you can accumulate multiple picks, one of the things that we have talked about with our team, we had a ton of draft picks. We moved some of that value into the 2023 draft, continued, continued to push it down the line where we're expecting to be able to take a lot of rookies basically in every draft going forward. That's, I mean, a huge advantage, a huge advantage to continue to have rookie draft capital throughout. And it is, it's not easy to do. It takes a lot of patience. It's something that you've been really good at. I probably, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't have been able to execute as well had I not been playing with you. And it's, and it's been challenging in some of my other leagues, but uh, uh, th this is like really the first key point that I would drive home that I think I've taken from you is this idea of trying to have volume and it's a lot like the real nfl draft we talk about teams not necessarily being better than each other at identifying talent so trading back in the real nfl draft and, and approaching it from a quantity over quality perspective makes a lot of sense that plays in dynasty the second thing that is really been driven home to me over the last couple of years is this idea of sort of future value uh and it's hard for me to understand at first you've you've referenced some of the great work that Pat Crane did back in the day when he was still writing at Rotoviz, where basically what he showed is every age that a player is in the league, they're essentially losing as a group that age, as they go to the next age is losing some dynasty value other than 21 year old rookies. They will gain some value going into their age 22 season. But even 22 to 23, you're losing some value and you're continuing to lose more and more value. That that part of it makes sense sort of intuitively. It's sort of hard to understand, but it it makes some sense. It, the, the part for me that, is, that I've sort of really crystallized is this idea that you want players that aren't going to bottom out, that aren't going to completely lose value one year to the next. We just talked about going forward in year one. What happens on those teams, you'll see some of the like dynasty calculators and things. They're typically overvaluing the veterans for what people in your league actually want. You, you Sean mentioned a second ago that people aren't going to necessarily want to trade in for these players, even when they haven't created. Like you said, some of them can just immediately go to zero and you're, and you're kind of screwed. I mean, even guys that are still in their 20s, Kenny Galladay is a good example. A year ago was still being drafted fairly high in startups i have him in some spots where i had him from when he was even younger and you can't even trade him for like a future third right now which i think is just sort of silly but his value one bad year with the giants and and i i think he's a decent rebound play right at, at this point in, in redraft and in dynasty but um one bad year his value has really gone to zero but even setting aside those types of players it's the ones that are maybe a little bit worse and now a year older you're going to see stuff that suggests to you that you can get more value than you're probably going to be able to get on the trade market. And what you kind of have to accept and, and then do is that if you want to get out of those pieces, you're going to probably have to sell low just to make sure you can get a deal done. And I say low sort of in air quotes, low compared to what I think some resources out there would suggest is a good value, but it's, it's probably fair, right? Because the, the people taking those players on, even at a lower cost, are moving a lot of value into depreciating assets. And so for them, it's it's a it's a challenging thing to justify as well. And so you get it, yeah, you get in this game where if you're taking a lot of veterans, that future trade value is tough. In our startup, we ended up taking Michael Thomas and Odell Beckham as players that we thought, especially where they were viewed last offseason, were maybe under undervalued a little bit, had some potential to gain value. They didn't necessarily gain a ton. And when we ultimately traded them, we were also trading them lower than what an expected return might be. I think we packaged them together and we got like a second round pick out of it or something. It was not like a, a massive haul. And yet we were still happy to get something out of them because in, in and those are guys that could continue to produce. But 
you've mentioned this idea before of wanting to trade a year early rather than a year late. The other thing with these veterans, if you do go down that road, is you have to be willing to trade at a lower value than you probably even think they're worth. It's it's a tough concept, I think, to grasp. But then the flip side of that is the youth players, when they don't even produce, the 21-year-olds as a group gaining value going into year 22, there's still reason for optimism, right? I mean, look at the QB class of last year. Basically, none of them did anything. We've talked about this on the show in Superflex Leagues. They're still going in the second round of startups. Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields, Trey Lance, a lot of optimism still. And people will say rightfully so. But we can also point to players where, you know, this is what a bust looks like. After one year, they have a bad year, and then they continue to be bad. So in some cases, I think training out of those types of players makes sense. I, I got asked about a Zach Wilson trade, and we talked about it on the show a little bit. And, and then I recently got asked again after their additional moves, am I happy I moved out of him? I kind of am because I think that's a guy whose value can go to zero. I got a couple second-round picks out of it. In Superflex, people were telling me that felt low. I think that's fine. You know, I was – very much happy with um, moving that value and, and trying to build a different way at quarterback. But it's this idea that even when the player doesn't hit at a young age, they, they maintain enough value. They can lose some value, but you don't see the value crater. You can still trade them. You don't even necessarily have to feel like you trade them low. Again, uh, Zach Wilson's an example of a guy who I drafted, I think 108, 109. I ended up trading him for essentially the equivalent of two second round picks and I think a, a small first round move up to get Traylon Burks. And people were telling me that I undersold him after he had a bad first year. I mean, two seconds and a, a one pick trade up for a late first isn't, you know, last year that I spent on Wilson doesn't feel like I, I really lost a ton of value from my initial investment. So there's that, that element as well. It's the complete flip side where even when the player's not good, there's still optimism. There's still reason, um, for people to want to, you know, buy into those players typically. And you just described a perfect sort of thought experiment that listeners can do anytime that they're looking at a player in Dynasty, whether it's your own player that you're thinking about moving, it's a package of, of players you're looking to acquire, and you want to go through the individual players and think to yourself, okay, what is the movement in the trade market if this player has a good season? What is the movement if this player has a bad season? And one of the things you'll find, and it's very much related to age, and there will occasionally be some other minor elements to it as well that you think through because you kind of know the different scenarios that could take place with this player. The younger guys, exactly as you described, if they have a good season, that trade value skyrockets. If they have a bad season, in many cases, it stays the same or it goes down a little bit. The exact opposite is true with veterans. And so you're, as you're moving through these players, you can ask yourself that question as you're putting together trades. Now, you referenced Pat's research, was, which was absolutely fantastic and really put some numbers to kind of what we intuitively see with these trades. And it, it fits what we know about how players develop as well, where the second year, and again, I mean, Blair has some great articles that people can Google on player age and player experience as it relates to breakouts at different positions. And what we do see is that that second year is the year that you see this massive explosion from so many of the young guys. And so that's the thing that really bolsters the value of someone like a Zach Wilson, who has had a bad season. And it's again, the reason that you have to have so many rookie picks and so many rookies, right? We see the rookie picks are going to continue to, rise in value as you get nearer to the time when they occur because now those guys are going to actually be in the nfl they'll contribute to your dynasty team but also because they're open-ended and the manager who has them can make them anybody not anybody within the context of obviously anybody within the universe of players who were available at that point in the draft but veterans you know once a pick is made it's locked into being that guy it can't be whomever that owner wants. And that's a big deal. So you have that rookie pick, you have a young player, he moves through, he moves in. And then as that player goes into year two, the value can really rise. So these players that we saw have big seasons. I mean, you're looking at a Kyle Pitts and a Jamar Chase, generational type of players. I mean, they were expensive to start with, but one of the things that I was mentioning on a show recently, it's just, it's so hard to believe 
is that in one of my main leagues last year, I was able to select Jamar Chase at the 106 because of enthusiasm for the quarterbacks. And quarterbacks are so valuable that there was even some question of people are like, you know, do you want to move back a spot and take Zach Wilson? It's like, you don't have quarterbacks. It's like, I don't have quarterbacks, but I'm going to stay there and take Jamar Chase, right? Those guys now are first round startup picks. And this element that we have had in the past with people have in the back of their minds, so I'm going to have to be so patient. I'm going to have to wait. I'm delaying my grat gratification so long. It, it's just not really true, right? We have the these rookies who come in, they impact the league right away. And then you're sitting on this absolute bonanza, both in terms of scores and in terms of what you can do in a trade.